So we do a lot of vineyards. You watch the channel all the time, and you know, you know, Joan and I love wine. Rarely, matter of fact, almost never, do we get a professor of winemaking. Thanks, we appreciate it. That's generous. But that's <laughs> it is not. It is not. This guy is really amazing. Well, we just got here at Accent. This is one of our new, this is Accent Cellar right on the edge of Dahlonega. And uh, <laughs> if anything, if the door says this is good, it's going to be good. And uh, we're going to come in here for a tasting. Matter of fact, Joan is already way ahead of me. And uh, she's over there, started her tasting. And uh, this is really a fun place. I really like this. This is really great. We, uh, we have been invited to go down to where they actually make their wine. So I'm going to kind of just show you the tasting room here. Isn't this kind of neat? There's Joni. And uh, you've got this, and then they've got all kinds of outdoor activities that exist around here and a, and a great deck. Here, I'll let you look outside. you got a nice area over there. They have live music on the weekends. Yes, they do. So... Um, the winemaker's been kind enough to invite me to go downstairs, so I'm going to go show you that. Let's go see what that looks like. So Tyler has been very kind enough to invite me to come down here where you guys are actually making wine. Indeed we are. We are in the midst of harvest season right now, so things are a little hectic space-wise. I just said about four and a half or 7,000 pounds of fruit arrived yesterday. Wow. So these three containers are Malbec right here. Those three over there are Cab Sav. Both of those are hailing from uh, Lake County, California. Yeah. Beck Stauffer Vineyards, uh, which is basically a vineyard management company throughout California, they are synonymous with quality. This is this is the fruit that we splurge on every year. This costs a little bit more than what we normally buy, but these make some of our reserve wines. Really, really high quality fruit. And uh, for instance, the Cab Sav that came in yesterday, the berries were a little bit smaller than I was thinking they would be. However, that's actually kind of a good thing whenever it comes to uh, uh, your fruit, especially out of an area like California. It's a bit more expected because it's much drier there. So mm. without that, uh, with that lower water content, the berries don't swell as much. So that means that you're going to have less juice to more skins. So you'll concentrate the flavors more. So it actually ultimately will end up making a better wine. You'll make a lower volume, but a more flavorful. So see your see the oak cast. Have you already started aging? Oh yeah, yeah. There we have the barrels, and then these gray cubes here. These are called flex cubes. Now I'm very very excited about these. We've really uh, bought. We basically tripled the number that we're getting this year. I have a couple more still uh, shipping this way. Uh, but basically, these flex cubes render traditional barrels obsolete. Mm. So basically whenever uh, you put something into a barrel, you're achieving two main things. First of all, you have that the wine has contact with the, the, the oak itself, which is going to leach those oak tannins right. into the wine, which right. is going to give it its color, its body, its flavor, that distinctive oak characteristic on the nose and that sort of thing. And then uh, the other primary reason why you put something into a barrel is something called micro-oxidation. So that's basically where small amounts of oxygen and other atmospheric gases are able to move through the porous uh, surface of the oak and interact with that wine in a very slow, controlled way. And that has a number of different effects on wine. One, it, uh, it, can, it helps smooth out flavor like an iron to a wrinkled shirt, particularly on the, the, the finish. And then um, it also bends pigmentation. So a lot of red wines are more of a purple hue post-fermentation and that barrel aging micro-oxidative process is really what shifts it more into the traditional red color that most people are used to seeing. Some varietals are more purple than others, like the Chamberson that you had earlier. Yes, it's great. Known for its deep, deep purple hue. Yeah, the very Chamberson very was very great. Good. And your p Pinot here is just, your Pinot Noir is just absolutely to die for. Thank you. Thank it you. is my yeah. favorite of the week, and we've been drinking a lot of wine this week. Yeah, that was our first Home run. I'm really, really proud of that one. But dare I say the 2020 vintage, which uh, I just barreled down into this Flex Cube the other day, I think it's going to be even better. It's going to be a awesome. little bit lighter in body and a little bit lower in alcohol, but I think it's, it's going to have a really nice jammy, mellow profile. Awesome. The, barrel, the most dangerous point for any barrel is whenever you open up the bung to check on it. You kind of think of it like tearing off a Band-Aid. It's suddenly exposed to the gases and the atmosphere, so oxidation is an issue. But then you also, at any given time, in any given winery, you're going to have a certain amount of uh, pathogens and such floating around in the air that can then 
settle down in there. That's how you can get bretomyces, uh, things that can turn your wine to vinegar, just all that, all the bad bacteria and fungi that you really don't want ruining your flavor profile. Every time you open it, that's what you're risking. So with the Flex Cube, since they have a tasting spout, I can taste it whenever I want uh, without the risk of introducing any sort of outside pathogen. Now, another thing that happens with barrels, and this also relates to the porous nature of them, is that it allows for a certain amount of water to evaporate out of them. Uh, often in the whiskey world, it's referred to as uh, the angel's share, and often in the wine world as well. Basically, you're losing uh, H2O volume and gaining uh, a more concentrated flavor. Because obviously all the flavors that, call, that, 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 uh, that go into making that particular wine taste the way it does, just keep getting denser and denser. That's why like a really high-end whiskey that's been in a barrel for like 20 years is so expensive because they'll open some of those barrels and there might only be two or three gallons left. Uh, generally, depending on the, the rate of, uh, or how high your humidity is in your barrel aging area, that's ultimately what dictates the rate at which it evaporates. So it can be anywhere from a liter to a liter and a half per month. So it can be quite a bit of volume. Now with the, uh, the flex cubes, they actually do not allow for water to leave it. So you don't lose your volume. Now, uh, then you might be asking, then how do you concentrate the flavors? Well, normally what we will do, and this is just, this just kind of depends on the winemaker and, and what sorts of styles they are and how they handle things. What we'll do is at processing, more often than not, we will bleed a bunch of juice out of it before fermentation uh, and then take that juice and you turn that into rosés. Mm. Uh, and what's left behind is a higher skin to juice ratio, thusly concentrating. So we concentrate on the front end rather than expecting the barrel to do that concentrated for us. That's basically the idea for us. Also, uh, some people that do have barrels uh, will still top them. So as it's losing mm. volume, you'll come back every two, three months with uh, that ideally that same vintage of wine. Sometimes you run out, so you'll end up with like 2%, 1% of another wine that you just have to top it back up so that you can reduce that empty space and thusly your, your risk for any sort of uh, uh, off flavors due to bacteria and such. Um, but yeah, and then also one of, one of the big selling points of these flex cubes and what really will ultimately in the long run render barrels obsolete, really more, the more accurate term there would be unsustainable, is that whenever you have one of these oak trees, like take a, I don't speak French, I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation, but I've always heard it pronounced cadu. Uh, there's a, basically it's an oak forest in France, it's where some of the, uh, one of the preeminent regions for growing some of the finest French oak trees for the best oak barrels. And basically it takes seven generations to grow one of those trees. And whenever you cut them down, Best case scenario, you might yield four barrels, maybe five. On average, you yield two barrels per tree. Hmm. And they're only harvesting 1% of, of the forest each year, so it's able to regenerate itself. Um, whereas if you're talking about these flex cubes versus a barrel, you can get enough staves for hundreds of flex cubes, right? Because they don't have to be a super particular shape, a particular width, a particular hmm. grain direction for you to be able to turn it into a barrel stave versus for a barrel, obviously that's the case. Also with a barrel at any given time, or really throughout the entirety of the barrel's existence, only about 25% of its surface area comes into contact with the wine. You have all this beautiful oak tannin on the outsides of these barrels that the, you have no way of leaching into mm. your wines. So this is September of 2020. The wines that you're making now, when will they be ready? Depends on the wine. So this Malbec that's sitting right here, this is literally still just juice. This was just processed yesterday. And basically what I'm about to do right now is uh, do a pH correction on it. So I'm going to be adding some tartaric acid to get that pH a little bit lower. And then uh, once I have all the additions in there and I've integrated them and a, lot, a little bit of elbow grease, um, I will pitch the yeast into it tonight and they'll begin fermentation. Hopefully they should start forming their cap within about 12 to 24 hours. And then basically once, as the fermentation is going on anywhere from a week to uh, two weeks, maybe on the high end, we prefer hot fermentations for our reds, so they tend to finish a little bit quicker in about a week. We'll come in probably twice a day, maybe three, depending on um, just how hot the fermentations get. Uh, and basically, uh, yeast is producing CO2 during that fermentation process and peeing alcohol. That CO2 is going to give all these grape skins buoyancy, so they'll float up to the top and form this dense cap. 
and that cap can get about a foot thick during peak fermentation. So basically I'll pull this lid off twice a day and then come in with this punch down tool and basically just push it and mush it around, get all of those skins back into contact with the juice. Uh, that's partially because as, it, as that cap rises and dries out, bad bacteria starts to grow by so re, resubmerging it into that alcohol environment. Even though, even for the first four or five days, the alcohol is only at like maybe five, six percent, that's enough to kill most bacteria that could cause a problem. So you want to resubmerge them down in there. Uh, again, it's also about temperature control because uh, the center of that fermentation can get really, really hot. I've seen some hit the better part of 90 degrees. Uh, wow. The temperature of your fermentation, depending on your yeast strain, is going to yield different flavor profiles. If you want a really light tropical sort of profile, typically you want to stick to the lower end of the range of a given yeast strain. And if you want, like us, in our, specifically with our reds, you want that jammier, more like stewed fruit sort of flavor, um, you'll, you're going to have better results with that on the higher end of its temperature. So range. that's, that's, so somebody that would be coming to accent to try this out, what, when, when will they be drinking this out of this vat right here? Well, you know, we'll have to see the <laughs> post fermentation and stuff. Wine is not a recipe. It's, it's, sure. it's reactionary to a certain degree because, you know, I, I didn't know what this food was going to look like until I opened that box. But roughly. It's kind of, kind of like Christmas, you know. But when will the bottle, when would a bottle be popped? Maybe two years. Two I mean, years. This, this, what this, an investment in time. It's, it, what an incredible it, investment in time. It requires quite a bit of patience to make it. Wow, that's like amazing. I, I had a cap sat from last year in that flex cube that's been aging for about 12 months now, or about 10 months. Uh, that'll probably need to sit in there for another two years. Another two years. That's amazing. That's also one of our reserve ones. So that's, oh, okay. That's, that's a lot longer than what we'll typically do. Because then I have the Pinot Noir right next door. That one I'll probably pull out a container in a year. That's going to be more of a table Pinot, uh, you know, not a reserve, a little bit less intense, just nice, approachable, and uh, uh, ready to drink pretty much right out of the gate. And then in this, this flex cube that we started by over here, that has the reserve Pinot Noir. So that has about one barrel worth that will spend about two years in barrel. Amazing. So that one, that'll be a higher price point and, and a bit more rich profile Amazing. overall. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. So we do a lot of vineyards. You watch the channel all the time and you know, you know Joan and I love wine. Rarely, matter of fact, almost never. Do we get a professor of winemaking? Thanks. We appreciate it. That's generous. But <laughs> it is not. It is not. This guy is really amazing. And, and the thrill of being able, you know, you drink, you drink a glass of wine and you go, oh, this is good. And it has this flavor profile or whatever else. But then to be able to come back here and see, it's not just a passion. It's really a love of the grape and it's a love of the process. And then actually just that final product of making a good bottle of wine and just sharing it not only with clients but friends and family. Wow, what a treat. And to be able to come back here, thank you so much, My and letting friend. us see something like this and just a, in, in a vineyard or, a, or, or even just the winemaking process. It's an incredible treat. Really appreciate you inviting us back here. Thanks so much. Anytime. This never happens. This never happens. Uh, we've got uh, something kind of unusual that's going to occur here. So, so what are we getting ready to do? Well, you caught me at just the right time. As, <laughs> as I was saying back in the winery process at Malbec juice yesterday, so it hasn't been inoculated yet. That's where you pitch the yeast into it and you begin the fermentation process. So we've got some raw Malbec juice from California. Uh, I just wanted to give you a taste of it. It's always a lot sweeter than what people typically would think of, but basically uh, we ferment all the sugar out of it. And whenever you really think about it, dissolved into one of those totes is about 400 pounds of sugar and the yeast will eat all of it and turn it into awesome. beautiful, beautiful alcohol and other flavors, esters, anthracite, your, your colors and all that sort of thing. So give that a little taste. See what you think. I get, I get kind of a... Okay, here we go. So silly. this is raw Malbec. How... And so... Basically, if I ferment all of the sugar oh, out of this... Oh, this is interesting. Yeah. You, there's echoes of what it will ultimately become, but without the alcohol in there, like, this is super proto-wine. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You gotta come try it. 
I, it's I, different. I wish uh, apple juice from the store tasted like this. <laughs> but it doesn't. That is amazing. And this will be wine in two-ish, three-ish years? Uh, well, it'll be finished wine in two, three-ish years. It will technically be wine in two wow. weeks. <laughs> uh, t okay, technically. But not... not no, nowhere near finished. finished. Yeah, yeah, nowhere yeah, near yeah, finished. Yeah, There's still a lot, lot of polishing to be done. How though. incredible! Yeah. And you can see it's still got all the skins and particulate matter in there. Mm, mm. Um, and this has already picked up quite a bit of flavor, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of color. Yep, there's oh, yeah, you get, skins. Yeah, yeah, you get all the good oh. stuff in it. Oh, that's this, great. This is the raw deal right here. That's awesome. Yeah. I can't tell you how many we've been to. <laughs> so many vineyards. I've never had this. I've never had this happen. Well, this is I incredible. Just, you caught me at the right time. Good. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> Thanks a bunch. Yeah, my pleasure, y'all. Cheers. Cheers. Well, we're leaving Accent Cellars. It's, look. We never come to a vineyard or a seller or a maker or any of those things and be able to have this kind of fun of talking to the winemaker. And a lot of times you'll get a, like a kind of a cool tasting. Yeah. And um, the the people here that were the, um, you know, the managers of the space just took so much time with us. Look, we didn't come announced. They were just, they were just awesome. If you come to Dahlonega, it's just right down from the square. And um, gosh, what a fantastic experience. We're probably going to be coming back in October. They're going to have food trucks and mountain music and just fun stuff. So uh, if you get a chance, Accent Cellars. How about that for a wine tasting? And do you know more about wine now than you did before? <laughs> I love RV life. Mm -hmm.